with one voice, we will sing. Every tribe and every tongue brings a harmony. With one voice, we will bring heaven's beautiful melodies down to this earth. We are two weeks away, two weeks away from Easter. Next Sunday on the church calendar is the day that we celebrate um, the triumphal entrance. We call it Palm Sunday. Two weeks from today, we will celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we think about that, as we think about what Jesus Christ went through to redeem us from the very thing that separated us from Him, I get excited. I get excited because we don't worship a dead God. We don't worship a dead God. The old hymn that I sang when I was a kid, I serve a risen Savior. He walks with me and talks with me. He is alive. He is alive. But the world is still searching. Even though the signs have all pointed to the one who was the Savior, the world is still searching. And we see this manifested in lots of different ways. Throughout our world, we see it in people who are acting out who are reaching out through various kinds of addictions, trying to find the answers to life's big questions. Amen. I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter, first letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. When you have that in your Bible, look up here so I know that you're ready. In fact, I want you to hold your Bible up. I want to see your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you need to get one. If you'll go after service, if you go right in this room right here, okay, we got a whole shelf full of Bibles. There's no excuse for none of you. There's, there's no reason for any of you to say, I don't have a Bible, because we got Bibles. Okay. We may not have a lot of other stuff, but we got Bibles. We got a few of them. First Corinthians chapter one, beginning with verse twenty-two through twenty-five. It says, "Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks." <coughs> Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. And as you teach us through your spirit, Father, we pray that you would let us know what you would have us to know, and then, and then let us do what you would have us to do as a result of this passage and your word speaking through us through your spirit to us today. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Where do people look for the answers to life's big questions? This verse reminds us, first of all, that human wisdom, human wisdom and human strength search in vain for answers. You see, you can't find the answers to life's big questions in human wisdom. 
You can't find the answers to life's big questions in human strength. Paul wrote, Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. And we see that illustrated very clearly in the Bible. <coughs> for instance, after Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish, the people wanted to force Jesus to become their king. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Beginning with verse 12, it says, When they had all when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now you need to understand, Jesus had fed five thousand men plus women and children with just Five loaves of bread and two fish. <coughs> and then afterwards, they collected the, the scraps. And the Bible tells us there was enough to fill up 12 baskets full of food. And look at what happened after that. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is coming to the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They wanted to use Jesus to satisfy their desires and their appetites. <coughs> Why? Why did they want to do that? Look at the miraculous sign he had done. He had fed all of these people with just five loaves and two fish. If he can do that, then he can take care of our needs for the rest of our life. We want to make him the king. Here's the one that we've been waiting for. You have to understand, you have to understand the context of this, and that is these were a group of people who were under the heavy boot of the Roman Empire. I don't know that they wore boots back then, maybe the sandal. The heavy sandal of the Roman Empire. But the foot of Rome was on their neck. And they saw one who had great power. One who had great power to do miraculous things. And in their human wisdom and understanding, they wanted to make Jesus their king. We want to make Jesus our king, but it's not because he can feed people with a few loaves and fishes. It's because he is the king. Yes. He is the king, and he is the Lord and Lord of lords. But they wanted, they figured they would, that he would be the answer to life's big questions. <coughs> There's another example for Greeks looking for wisdom. Paul made his way as part of his missionary journeys to Athens. Athens was a famous city for wisdom. Here was, this was the, the, the geographical center, if you will, for enlightened thinking. <clears throat> Athens was famous for a lot of people. Plato and Aristotle had taught there centuries earlier. And the people there considered themselves philosophers. And they wanted to hear what Paul had to say. They were eager at first to hear Paul's ideas. But then he does something. He mentions something about the resurrection of the dead. And when he does that, they, they are turned completely off. They sneer at him and cut him off. Look at it. It's in Acts chapter 17. Go ahead. Start it at the beginning. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler, now look at the words, they're calling him names, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Why did they say this? They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and about the resurrection. And they absolutely were turned off by it. 
I want you to think about this. They couldn't see how Paul would be able to give them any answers to life's big questions. They couldn't see it. They, 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 they completely cut him off. Their wisdom would not accept such unreasonable claims as someone being raised from the dead. And so they completely were turned off by what he said. And yet still today, I believe that in each of us, a part of us wants to feel signs of power and hear ways of wisdom. Maybe we don't expect Jesus to miraculously produce dinner for us by praying a prayer and breaking bread and feeding our family. But isn't there a part of us that, 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 that seeks and desires excitement? I mean, I want you to think about this for a minute. Isn't there something within us that is seeking for excitement? Don't we have an appetite to be stimulated and entertained and captivated? <laughs> I mean, we really do. There are plenty of things in this world that are designed to do just that. And so oftentimes what happens is we, are, we have all of these things out there in our society to stimulate us, to entertain us, to pass our time. And then we come to church, and sometimes we're disappointed. Church doesn't excite us like an overtime basketball game excites us. Church doesn't excite us and stimulate us like the latest video game or, or the newest song by your favorite artist. Church doesn't entertain us like some Hollywood movie or some television show. For these reasons and lots more, it's easy for us to put church and the things of God second in our thoughts and in, in our attention because all of these other things are like spectacular signs that grab our attention and seem to promise an answer to life's big question. <coughs> when it comes to wisdom, the world thinks it has so much of it and is so full of it that we can so easily be drawn into thinking like the world. On the one hand, worldly wisdom seems to offer the answer to so many problems. Do you have a problem? Buy this latest gadget. Are you hurting? Take this pill. Are you in distress? Watch Dr. Phil. <laughs> Do you need help? There's a government agency for that. And we can easily find ourselves like the rest of the world instead of trusting in God and turning to Him first when we have problems, when we have difficulties, He becomes a second or third or fourth option after worldly wisdom fails to work. <coughs> On the other hand, alongside of all these promises to answer life's big questions, worldly wisdom also plants doubts in our minds. We have to be honest here. You need to think about this. Is it logical that a loving God would let you suffer? Would let people suffer? We just we just watched over the past several weeks of, of, a, of a whole nation in, in great tragedy. The nation island, the island nation rather of Japan, has gone through just one one problem after another. And we even ask ourselves, we, in, our, in, our, in our finite minds, we say, how could God allow so much suffering to take place? Can we really know that Jesus rose from the dead or that what the Bible has to say is true? You see, these are the questions we begin to ask because we have arrived when it comes to wisdom. <coughs> and we think we know better than God knows. And so then we say, maybe there aren't any answers to life's big questions. But just as in Paul's day, you and I have to face the temptation to ignore God's answers to life's big questions. For you see, God's answer doesn't sound powerful or wise. God's answer doesn't sound like the end-all to be-all 
for the world's problems. It sounds weak and it sounds foolish. And one of the reasons that it sounds weak and foolish is because we don't know what life's big question is. We think we know, but we don't know until God reveals it to us. My second point here is that Easter reveals God's answer to life's big question. But before we can see how Easter reveals God's answer, we need to be clear on what the big question in life is. So often we think the big question is something like this. How can I get the most out of life? How can I find inner peace? How can I feel good about myself? How can I make life fair for me? How can I make sure others like me? How can I ensure that I'll be remembered after I pass away? How can I feel closer to God? You see, the problem is, is that we're asking the wrong questions. None of these questions will acknowledge God's answer as the right one. And you know why that is? It's because every one of these questions focuses on our wisdom and power. How can I? How can I? How can I feel good about myself? How can I get the most out of life? How can I make life fair for me? You see, the real question not, doesn't begin with how can I? The real question is how can or how has God? How has God? The real question begins with how has God? How has God brought me close to Him? How has God saved me? That question doesn't come naturally to us because that, that question assumes that we're lost and we're in need of being saved. <coughs> it assumes that we don't have any power and wisdom to save ourselves. And so before God answers life's big question for us, he has to crush our pride and he has to crush our ego so we can discover the right answer. You see, God is not simply demanding outward obedience. God is not simply demanding outward obedience. He's also demanding perfect inner obedience as well. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, let me tell you what I mean by that. He demands our total love and trust in Him as the one and only God. See, that's an inner obedience. That's what's happening inside of you. He demands that His name be continually in our hearts and on our lips as we go about our daily life. He demands that we never neglect His Word. He demands that we spend time in prayer. He demands that we share the gospel as we live our lives. He demands that we help those in need and that we defend those whom others are attempting to tear down. Mm -hmm. And he forbids lust and greed and covetousness and all other evil desires. You see, the truth is, is that we have failed. We have failed. We have no power to come to God. We have no wisdom to know the way. We sit in, in the dust and ashes of our own worldly works, worthless works, rather. Mm -hmm. Worldly works, worthless works. Yeah. It's ridiculous to ask, how can I bring myself closer to God? That's a dumb question. Rather, ask the true big question in life. What has God done to bring me closer? to him. So, in two weeks, as we think about Easter, the significance of that event, we're reminded that it is about Christ crucified. It's about Christ crucified. Or as Paul put it, we preach we preach Christ crucified. Put that verse up there. Jesus. 
and we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. What did Paul say? He said when we came, we didn't come with flowery words, but we preached Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor, wait a minute. What you're saying then is the greatest act that was ever performed in the world was when Jesus allowed himself to die on a cross. When he was at the weakest moment in his life. I want you to think about how ludicrous this is. <coughs> Here was a man who came to the earth. He said, I and the Father are one. Here was a man who came to earth and said, if you see me doing something, it's, it's only because I'm only doing what I see my Father do. Because I am the Father. The Father and I are one. And then, he got arrested. And the disciples scattered. They took off. They denied him. Peter three times denied him. The crowd that had welcomed him a week earlier with palm fronds and laying their coats in the ground were the same ones that were crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He was taken out to the whipping post and he was beaten to within an inch of his life. God, is this your plan? God, is this your big plan for the world? This man is within hours of dying. He, he is not exhibiting any strength of any kind. He is a broken, beaten man. This is not like he did when he turned water into wine. This isn't like he did when he took five loaves and two fish and he broke them and gave them to the people to eat. Here was a man who couldn't even save himself. And the enemy is laughing. <laughs> I almost got you. I'm almost one. Then he's forced to carry his own cross up to a hill called Golgotha. The place of the skull. Where he's nailed to a cross, hands and feet, and then hung there to die. Between two common thieves. Where is the strength? Where is the power? Where is the wisdom? Christ crucified. The answer to all of your questions. <laughs> what? What? Can God be any more foolish than that? You want to know the answer to your questions? Christ crucified. <laughs> what? But you see. It appeared to be a foolish thing for God to sacrifice His Son for sinners. But what wisdom? What wisdom? For on the cross, God punished His one and only Son in our place for our sins. And through that act of mercy and grace, He freely forgives us while at the same time remaining just since our guilt had to be punished and it was punished through Jesus Christ. Christ crucified, the payment for your sins and for my sins. Christ crucified, it appears to be such a weak thing, but what power? For by the cross, Jesus crushed Satan's head and freed us from sin's captivity. And he broke the chains of death. Because on Friday, dead. On Sunday, alive. Hallelujah. You see, Christ crucified appeared to be weak and foolish. But God reveals the reality of it to us. Christ crucified is the answer to all of life's questions. And the 
there's something that we need, and we're that's something that we need, and we're going to grow spiritually. Christ crucified is the answer to those questions. How do I get the most out of life? Christ crucified. How do I find happiness and fairness? Christ crucified. How do I find enlightenment and fulfillment? It's in Christ crucified. How do I cope with pain and suffering or whatever other questions come up? It's because of Christ crucified. Yes. So often we don't see that, and so we fail to see that Christ crucified is the answer to all of those questions as well. That's why we need to keep on growing in our faith. Our worship is not designed to entertain. If you're looking for entertainment, there's lots of other venues out there. But it is designed to bring you Christ crucified. Yes, that's the real answer to life's big question. Keep on coming. Keep on worshiping every week so that you can continue to see how Christ crucified is your answer. Just because we struggle in understanding all that the Bible has to say, that doesn't make it foolish. That doesn't make it foolish. Keep on reading your Bible every day and seeing Christ crucified as God answers all of your questions through His Word. Easter, Christ crucified, answers life's big questions because it points us to the cross of Christ. Eastern religions, modern wisdom, powerful sensations, miserable. When the glory of the Easter season ends, we will have the absolute guarantee that Christ crucified is the answer because Christ is alive. Christ is risen. And he keeps leading us through the big questions that you face in life because Christ died in your place. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, we thank you for Christ crucified. For Father, it's there that we find hope. It's at the foot of the cross, Father, that we find peace. It's at the foot of the cross, Father, that we find acceptance. Even though we have sinned and even though we have failed you so miserably, through Jesus Christ, through the, the seeming weakness and agony that he went through, Father, your greatest work, your most powerful act accomplished for us something that we could never do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We thank you for Christ crucified. We thank you because you have given to us a reason to continue on. You have given to us a reason for hope and a reason for joy and a reason to work. Because Jesus is the answer. Jesus, Christ crucified.